Good evening. Hello, hello, hello. So sorry to interrupt. Uh, I'd like to welcome you to tonight's Fervor and Aramir pop-up at Golden Cafe. Uh, my name is uh, Max Bainheisen. I'm a journalist based up in Perth. Uh, in my role as a food journalist, I've been really, really lucky to have seen the stories of Fervor and Aramir from up close. And I, hand in my heart, think that both are two of the most important food stories in Western Australia and I don't think it's unfair to say Australia. Before we begin, I'd just like to acknowledge we're standing on Wadundi land. It always was, always will be. I guess it was, it was easy for us in terms of working out that all of our values aligned, you know, and it was, it was all about the land. And for us, that's an important part in the Southwest, I think. The authenticity of what Yoda and his team do and what we are trying to achieve here was, was a real alignment, I think, and was really exciting. Like, it was so raw and something that we'd not really heard of before. Just a novelty factor, it was actually people that were genuinely going out and learning and getting educated for us was something that we were like, wow, that's, that's where we want to be. I like your idea though of trying to keep it keep it local. Yeah. That way back in the day when the, you know, people were brewing from home, some sort of local farmer would walk out and he'd just pick ingredients from the paddock. Yeah. And that instead of using hops and all these other ingredients, and that was what he'd use to flavour his beer. Yeah. So to be able to go down to the coast or anywhere in the region and do exactly that is such a cool opportunity. I think if you're gonna do something and take yourself out of your natural environment, what you believe is true. And I think what you guys believe is inspirational for any business, like, and any person. There was no right, we need to do this marketing strategy and we need to do this. It was more like, this is what we believe in. Do you guys align? <laughs> uh, to me, the, the most exciting thing about native ingredients is not knowing what to expect. And I guess why it's, it's so pivotal that we collaborate with Yoda, not only to understand where the ingredients come from and the story behind them, but also what type of flavours they expect and tasting flavours you've never tasted before. And I guess that's where a lot of the inspiration comes from and immediately I was very keen to put it into beer. That element of surprise is what I love the most. The whole point about this is about the authenticity, isn't it? Like we said from the beginning that there was no point in going out in this if the native ingredient was going to fall to the wayside and was going to become a marketing term. And we want, in fact, you, you said to us that I want the story behind the growers, I want the story behind the ingredient, what it's traditionally used for, so that we can tell that story. And that, for me, resonated from, from day one, because I was just like, finally. You can't necessarily expect it to be done through a small piece on a label or word of mouth. You kind of do need a bit more than that. Um, people buy beer and take it home. They're not getting told that story. So I think the label's going to open up a lot more for us. To really, really push what both entities are trying to do, you know, and the beliefs that we, we want. The story further, it's particularly fitting that we're here in Margaret River. The very first event happened in 2013 in May, just after Paul had gotten back from staging around the world at some really, really important restaurants. With a super strong sense of identity and where the chefs uh, worked incredibly hard to find ingredients that spoke about uh, a location, about a place, about time. And Paul and Bree and Steph, they started representing Western Australia, but they've taken the further story nationally and internationally. They've uh, gone to New York to film with the most unlikely food personality you'd ever find, Action Bronson, a rapper turned uh, food hero. Being with you for that short amount of time, I tasted things that I've never ever tasted in my life. Um, 34 years on this earth, you know what I mean? So you've opened my eyes to many different things and knowledge and I could never repay you. you pretty much changed my outlook on life and the moon and the stars, you know what I mean? With it, I've made it through without a curse. I mean, that, thank you. <laughs> Safe to say it's phenomenal. Safe to say you're alive. So over the top of the emulsion, we got uh, a maca couscous, 
roasted macadamia, shaved macadamia. We've got a macadamia milk with macadamia oil. And then we have um, yolk and a bit of blood root through there as well. You get macadamias in the supermarket and it's almost like, I don't know, it's like they're stale. A bit of a secret that we're growing such good macadamias down here. And then the other ingredients that are highlighted is the yolk and the blood root. That's the, the blood root, so we've just turned it, blitz it into an oil. Because we only get a certain amount each year, we blitz it into an oil so that it stretches a long way, but people taste it. It's like a bush chili, basically. So in Albany, it's called Manang, and that's what the Manang Noongar people are named after, so. And obviously the other part of this story is that of Evan Hader, um, the chef at an amazing, amazing place called Aramea. It's an off-the-grid cellar door and winery started by Anne Spencer. And when Evan joined around the same time, 2012, I think, it steadily grew. Uh, the story evolved and Evan, together with Anne's support, really turned Aramea into, in, into an example of what an off-the-grid, sustainable, green-thinking operation can be. They also raise their own pigs and sheep. Uh, the pigs are used to regenerate the land. They dig up arum lilies, those beautiful white plants that are covered everywhere. Yes, the, the locals know it looks beautiful, but they're invasive, they are a pain. You cannot get rid of them. Unless you happen to have a squad of, um, of crack-eating pigs. They just go there, they eat, they dig them up, and they return the land and make it arable again. We started to mess around with a bit of um, weed control basically. What, what we found works is, is pigs. Uh, a friend of mine was a pig farmer and he just said that they eat, they eat them. And I was like, oh, okay, well, we'll give this a shot. So got, got a couple of pigs off him, they came in, they started eating the green and because they naturally forage all day, they just, they just dug up the bulbs. And then it gives us the opportunity to plant natives back in behind it and try and bring, bring the land back to where it, where it may have once been. The byproduct of um, of that is that I get delicious pork, so it's kind of win-win in a way. So Will you use all of this, or do you actually sell some as well? Uh, I've sold a little bit to to other chefs that I uh, that I respect or that I know are going to use the pork properly. Yep. Um, you know, don't just give it away to people that aren't going to give a shit about it. Yeah. So I think it is the best pork, just because of the treatment of these animals. They're so happy. They're, yeah. So relaxed. The meat itself is so subtle as well. I find it's really sweet and just delicate flavour. And... Well, this this is you know basically katsu, but with the char siu as well. It's basically a rolled pork belly that we then cook for about two days. We put that into the cool room. We cool it down overnight. It just turns into a bit of a jelly, and then put it into a char siu stock. But what I've done here is I've I've cut it and then egg washed it and crumbed it and then deep fry it and put it on a little sandwich so. Evan's black book is filled with the names of local farmers and producers that share his idea that, that you have to be kind to the planet, that you want the next generation to get the planet and inherit the land in a much better shape than you found it in. So you talk about making your connections with the traditional owners, I'll talk about creating a relationship with a farmer who's who's doing something you know and, and that connection is at times I can, I can go onto their property and pick my own vegetables and it's like it's like I'm stepping into their house you know it's like they're giving me access to something that's that no one else can get but you know working on those relationships as a responsibility of myself is to put that time in and it's the responsibility of the other modern chefs is to to see that and, and see what they can do to make it better and to contribute to that, to make it easier for other people to already start at that top level so then they can take it to the next level and so on. Yeah. A strawberry gum stout from the beer farm up in Metricop. Uh, today happens to be the day they're releasing it officially. I think it's exciting alcohol meet Australiana mashup that we're seeing more and more of. So we have a little wattle seed mousse and over the top we've painted it with uh, a ruby chocolate. We have some beautiful Geraldton wax granita and then we've made a, a reduction out of the strawberry gum stout. I guess there's sweetness but also bitterness in there. Uh, strawberry gum was one of the first things that I kind of 
smelt and tasted and the, and the first thing I thought of was stout. And uh, that's, that's kind of where the journey started. I mean, it just started off as a bit of a casual chat, let's make a beer. And um, it's not like strawberries and cream, but it's got that berry type character about it. It's quite unique. It's not like your, your average strawberry. So you'll balance that out with a bit of smokiness and, um, and stout, you'll enjoy it. The more people that are using the ingredients, and you said the same thing last night, is uh, they're in our backyard, you know? And we're creating beers for this backyard and potentially everyone else's yard, so why not put the ingredients that are native to this country front and centre of what we do? Not about making a large volume or a large amount, it's always about respecting the ingredient and also making the beer to suit that, not the other way around, going we want to make thousands and thousands of litre of this so we can just sell it by the litre, bang, bang, bang. If Yoda could get more of the strawberry gum then we probably would have made more of this, but this is what we're available to and this is all we've got to work with, that's great. Let's not compromise and damage the quality of, of the product just by diluting it with, with more beer. So it was a, a given just to go, no, we'll just make less um, to ensure that the native ingredient shines. So I was like beating myself up, like I can't bring pigs in because I'll just destroy the land. But then I'm looking around and it's just arum lilies and invasive species anyways, except for the marries and carries and jarrahs and there's nothing else. There's no native grasses or anything, you know? So I'm like, well, what's wrong with bringing the pigs in? Let's have a crack. Give these trees another chance and then, you know, plant back in behind it. Yeah. That's the intention, you know. It's, it's, I mean, that's the thing with the native ingredients is the season's so short that you want to utilise it when it's at its peak. Some things might only be in season for a week or two with the berries. Once the season is finished and you can't get any more, you've just got to sort of accept that, which is a little bit tricky for chefs and people in restaurants because they want to put something on the menu for three months. I think once we value these ingredients and, and use it at its peak brightness and once the season's finished, it's finished. You know, you move on to the next ingredient. And I was thinking about it, it was a really great question to ask, what's the modern chef about? And funnily enough, I interviewed Evan for a story a couple of weeks ago, and he said this really, really amazing quote. And it's about having the humility, the understanding, when to understand that the produce is the star. And together, I think Evan and Yoda and Paul and Anne and all their people, all the connected people, they're telling a really, really important story. And it's one of the reasons why I think Margaret River is right now one of the most exciting places to eat in Australia.